I'm the program director for this program. Um, I'm from Chicago. And uh, currently, I'm with the University of Finland, Department of Emergency Medicine, as uh, um, a faculty there. Um, so welcome to the RP Bimonthly CME program in collaboration with uh, the Chicago Medical Society. The webinar CME committee appreciates your sure. and support for the programs. I also especially thank the leadership of RP, the Board of Trustees, as well as the Executive Committee uh, for putting this uh, novel program for the sake of uh, the physicians. Uh, we have today a thought-provoking intellectual topic for presentation uh, from a distinguished speaker from Harvard. So we have got about 40 to 45 minutes presentation followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. Please feel free to chat, uh, use the chat room for questions to the speaker. Today's presentation will also be posted on the RP website for those who are not able to join us today. Uh, however, you know, we will get the CME credits only for today. Please submit your pre and post presentation surveys to claim the CME credit. So today's topic is on metacognition. Necessary fallibility, it is okay to be human. The distinguished speaker, Dr. Charles Neil Posner is the executive director of Neil and Elsie Wallace Center for Medical Simulation at Brigham and Women's Hospital and associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. Boston. Dr. Posner's research interests are in non-technical skills and team training, and his primary clinical interest is in resuscitation at the Human Factors and Cognitive Engineering Lab at Stratus, an acronym for Simulation, Training, Research, and Technology Utilization System Center. Amongst other projects, Dr. Posner is working with NASA to facilitate their mission to Mars. Dr. Pastor has been an invited speaker nationally and internationally, and has been a consultant on simulation projects across the globe, including India. He was honored as an inaugural fellow in the Academy of the Society of Simulation in Healthcare in the year 2017. On a personal note, I'm proud to be associated with him as a visiting fellow at Stratus a few years ago. The moderator of the program is Dr. David Banyan, uh, Assistant Professor, Section of Psychiatry and Medicine, and Director of Transplant Psychiatry Program at Rush University Medical Center, Chicago. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banyan, and I'm, I know he's on vacation. I pulled him from vacation. Uh, I was very kind enough, and hopefully he will join us pretty soon. Before we start the program, I request the President of RP, Dr. Sudhakar John Lagada, to address. Dr. John Lagada. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you, Dr. Murthy, for bringing the outstanding speakers for our uh, CME webinar. As we promised, you know, this is a membership benefit for RP members, and we plan to give 20 hours free CME this year. And uh, remember that every second and fourth Wednesday, we are giving the CME webinars for our members. And I want you to participate and uh, get the updated information from the outstanding speakers we are here today. And this is something new topic for me and uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hear from our uh, uh, distinguished speaker today. Uh, and uh, back to Dr. Murthy. Thank you, Dr. You're, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, please go ahead, thank you. Okay, I, you want me to go ahead, or you want uh, the moderator? Well, you are the you know you are the speaker, I, and I will begin. I just didn't want to step on anyone's toes. Oh, so no, let me. No. I, I'm going to share my. Well, I'm going to share my screen, and then I'll then I'll start really quickly. Where is the? There we go. And once, can you see my screen? Yes. And I just need to turn the computer sound on. Hold on for one second. And I think I've got it. And after doing this for about four or five months, I think I've really kind of gotten it at this point. So if things don't work out, I'm going to blame the fact that I haven't done it very much, but I've done it actually way too much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for inviting me. This has been really uh, an, an opportunity to sort of meet with people from all over the country. 
I'm not all over the country, but at least Chicago. Hopefully it's all over the country. I don't know where everyone comes from. And ultimately, uh, I, I appreciate this, the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I will tell you that I met with uh, Dr. Murthy uh, several years ago when he came and spent some time with us. And one of the things that I really enjoy doing when I have felt visiting fellows is to share some of the things that we do uh, from our simulation uh, center. And most people think of simulation as an educational tool. And it is a phenomenal educational tool. And I, 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 I could do a whole talk on how simulation works in education. But I also think it's a phenomenal assessment tool. I think it's a phenomenal research tool. And as Dr. Murthy and I were discussing earlier, I also think it's a great tool to assess processes within healthcare institutions. But today I'm gonna to talk about something that has become near and dear to my heart, which is non-technical skills in medicine. We've, we've talked for years and years and years about knowledge and skills and decision-making, and we've, we've spent a lot of time, very important time, teaching all of this, but what we haven't spent a lot of time doing is discussing how to, how to use all those skills that we've concentrated on in healthcare education and use them efficiently and effectively. And I will tell you, that has to do with communication and the non-technical skills that support the technical skills so that we can actually do a really, really good job in taking care of our patients. And this is a talk that I, I, I really enjoy because it really gets, gets to the crux of how we can start thinking about using uh, our, our non-technical skills to improve the care that we provide to patients. So thank you for having me. I have no conflicts of interest to report, but as I always say, I'm always looking. So if you have something really good that I could get involved with that could turn me into a multi-billionaire, I'm always ready to do that. So just, just send things my way. Let me tell you first a little bit about Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's a large 800-bed uh, hospital within the, the Boston Medical Complex. It's on the, it's on the campus of Harvard Medical School. And uh, we, uh, our mission is really uh, tripartite. It's, it's excellent clinical care. It's excellent research. And it's cutting edge education. And I'm very lucky to work for a hospital that really does invest in education and, 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 and wanting to sort of make the next generation of uh, clinicians the best they possibly can be. And when I started this uh, journey in 2003, uh, there was very little institutional knowledge of simulation. And over the last 17 years, we've seen more and more simulation being, uh, being, being used within the healthcare uh, continuum. Let me show you a little bit about Stratus. Stratus is a small center, but a very active center. We take we 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 teach and, and have participants 20,000 user hours a year. We do skills-based training, we do uh, scenario-based training, and we do we do research, process improvement, and assessment as well. This is our operating room where we've done a lot of work, and I'll tell you about some of the work we've done in our operating room. Uh, and this is our skills room. It's actually much bigger now, or not bigger, it's smaller. It's got more equipment in it. This was an old picture, but we allow people to come into the center and practice various skills. And this is another skills room that has less sophisticated skill uh, trainers. But again, we allow people to take care of patients or pseudo patients in a safe environment. And I think that's a really important uh, part of what we have contributed to medicine, where we can, instead of doing, having the see one, do one, teach one uh, philosophy, we can see one, do many, and then ultimately do it on a real patient. And then hopefully we can teach at some point. But what I really want to talk about is what Dr. Murthy was saying was metacognition. And I am not an expert in metacognition. But I will say we need to begin to think about how we think, okay? And how we think, how we comprehend, how we make decisions is an important thing to start thinking about. Because we've always done it, we've always done this in a, you know, organically. And now we've got to think about it strategically. 
And there are numerous theories, and I'm not going to get into the specific theories. There's, you know, system one and system two. There's, there's long-term and short-term, uh, you know, uh, categorization of, of, of memory and cognition. But as I will say, and what I think what Dr. Murphy said earlier, it's still incredibly imperfect. But if we don't do more research and thinking about it, we won't get better at it. And I think we really do need to get better at how we think, how we work in, in, in difficult situations to get the best care for our, for our patients. Well, this is a picture of the Boston bombing. And I put this up there because this is the, one of the worst situations that one can be in. There are other worst situations, but here you've got what looks like utter chaos. But what you hope, what you hope is that there are pockets of work that are being done there that are less chaotic. And that has to do not only with the skills that one has, but with the skills of communication that one needs to use in order to deliver those skills in an effective way. And we've all been in, I'm sure we've all been in situations where we've been cognitively overloaded and our ability to take care of a patient has been compromised in that setting. And what I will say is that in situations like this, we need to have either uh, processes or principles or ways of dealing with things. And I'll talk about two of them tonight so that we can better manage these situations in a, in a much more uh, logical and efficient and effective way. And this, you know, I was, I was working when the Boston bombing uh, occurred. It was one of the scariest days of my life. It was very, very uh, uh, stressful. And I could have, I could have used better non-technical skills to manage it, although we did get through it and none of our patients died, thank God. So what I'm gonna talk about today is why we will never know everything. And that's one of the things I really hope I, 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 I sort of impart tonight, that humans make mistakes. That is part of the human condition. And we as physicians and as healthcare providers think of mistakes as failures. And I don't want people to make mistakes, but they're not failures in the vast majority of cases. They're human. We will make mistakes, but luckily, if we do our job well, we will be able to work with people that will mitigate the, or help us mitigate the consequences of those mistakes. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. How can we develop strategies that allow us to be human, but still provide the best care to patients? So we'll talk about, we won't know everything, we can still manage our patients well. I'll show you one of the strategies that we've used and how, how it's been really delayed and being adopted. I'm gonna talk about something, and I hope some people know about this, crisis resource management, which is a set of principles and strategies to help us approach difficult situations and try to get them organized in a way that will take care of uh, patients better. And then maybe we'll get into a, a few thoughts on uh, future directions. So this is a study that was done in 1975. I, I get really recent data, so uh, pardon me for giving a, a paper from 1975 from Gorovitz and McIntyre. They basically said there is something called necessary fallibility. Okay, we will never be perfect. And that's a very comforting thing for me because I don't want people to think I'm perfect. And I want other people to think that they're not perfect. We'll take better care of patients under those circumstances. And again, I don't want people making mistakes. I'm not encouraging poor care or mistakes. What I'm encouraging is that it, it's, it's human to make mistakes. Why do we fail? It's basically necessary. Can we control things? Yes. You know, if we work on ignorance, which is the imperfect understanding something, we can teach people things. And then we can work on ineptitude, failure to apply the knowledge correctly. And we work on that on a day-to-day -day basis when we're taking care of patients ourselves or we're teaching students, we try to control those things. But even if we were perfect at controlling those things, we would still make mistakes because we're human beings. 
this is one of my favorite studies. This was by a gentleman from Gaffery uh, at the University of Michigan. And he was a surgeon who looked at three operations within the Veterans Administration system. He looked at esophagectomies, gastrectomies, and pancreatectomies. Very complicated operations, not just you know, appendix or gallbladder. These are really complicated operations. And what he did is he compared, he went, this is a, 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 a uh, study of medical records, and he looked at mortality and volume of care, volume of cases. And I'm not gonna, it, it's very complicated, but what I will say is on the left where it says mortality, the places that had the highest mortality did the fewest cases. In the, patients, in the places that had the least mortality did the greatest number of cases. And that was the slope of the curve. And it was pretty linear. And you would say, well, the people who, who uh, do more, more cases have fewer mistakes. That's just the nature of doing more practice and fewer mistakes, fewer deaths under those circumstances. So what he did is he said, let's not look at mortality just mortality directly. MI, post surgical MI, not post surgical PE, but what were directly related to somebody mishandling mis, uh, a particular part of an operation. And what he found was that linear correlation between volume and mortality went away. It didn't, it wasn't a direct correlation. And he went one step further. What he said is of those cases that were had complications in the operating room, what was the failure to rescue? The middle column is just the number of co complications. The column and the, the, the third set of uh, uh, bar graphs, those the mortality after the mistake was made. And what happened was the slope of the line and the direct correlation went to back to the original mortality volume curve. And what he surmised was that mistakes will happen whether you're doing lots of operations or fewer operations but the mitigation of the consequences of mistakes is likely related to the ability of teams functioning well as teams because they work together more frequently and they're more practiced. And I think that's an important thing to think about is that everyone will make mistakes, but how do we mitigate the consequences of mistakes is really, really important. And I would say a lot of the problems that we have in medicine is related to two things communication, and ego. And we'll talk about those as well. So I was very lucky to uh, work with a gentleman called, named Atul Gawande, who most people know. He's an author, he's a surgeon, and he's a wonderful guy. And he worked with the WHO on the first uh, surgical checklist uh, uh, program. And this was, the, this was the original study. It was a surgical safety checklist to reduce morbidity and mortality in a global population. It was a very, very well done study. And it was using multiple uh, institutions in multiple countries. They were rural, they were academic, they were poor, they were rich. And what he found out is if you did routine checklists before they induced the patient, before they operated on the patient, and before the patient was taken out of the operating room, not in the setting of a complication, but just doing a routine checklist so you didn't have to remember everything, you could reduce morbidity and mortality. And what he showed, whoops, I, I went a little bit too quickly. What he showed was that complications and deaths were decreased significantly. There was a 38% reduction in complications, and there was a 47% reduction in deaths. And you've, if, if any of you are surgeons, you know that there are safety checklists that people are using all over the world. And that's a wonderful thing. And I, I think checklists are great. They're not the only answer. They're not a panacea, but they're part of the answer. And I'm working with a team 
10 or 15 years, I can't remember how long ago this was, this was 2009, 11 years ago, we're now working on how do we make that checklist better. But a tool is much smarter than me. And what he said was, if they work well in a routine situation, do they, will they be helpful in a crisis situation? And he wrote the, the book, Checklist Manifesto, and he looked at various industries, high-risk industries, high-reliability industries that use checklists to improve, improve patient care. And he went, he went in one of the industries was the aviation industry. And they're the, they're, they do incredible work with checklists. And he says, well, what does the pilot do when there's a problem in, in the cockpit? The first thing they do is they divide up responsibilities and someone's reading a checklist. Because we know in cognitively overloaded states, our memory, our working memory, is not going to be quick enough to remember everything. So if there's a checklist, the likelihood that you're going to forget something important is decreased. Not zero, but decreased. So he said, well, why don't we, why don't we look at checklists in the operating room, not the routine checklist, which has shown benefit, but if there's a crisis in the operating room, will having a checklist to mitigate the, that crisis, that particular crisis, be helpful? And we endeavored on this study. And we published our study in 2013. And this was the only study ever published by the New England Journal of Medicine using simulation as the test tube. And the results were not surprising. So what we did is we developed checklists. And that's one of the things I was asked to do, help with. We, were, we basically did literature review, we, we, made, we drafted checklists, we went to national guidelines, and these were the, the 11, we had 12 ultimately, problems in the operating room that we developed checklists for. And this was a multidisciplinary group. I'm an emergency physician. We had other people from other specialties, mostly surgeons, mostly anesthesiologists, but we also had people from other specialties, and we developed those critical actions that were necessary to mitigate the consequence of the mistake. And this is one of our checklists. And it doesn't look like a lot of the algorithms we see in the American Heart Association with the American College of Surgery, because we not only developed the checklist, but we went to uh, the, the chief safety officer of Boeing and we said, show us how you build a checklist. And instead of having these crazy algorithms where they were going in all different directions that no one could read and use effectively in a, in a, in a stressful situation, he said, you need to put things on the left-hand side. It's step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. And if you needed information that was not going to be in your, in your immediate memory, you could go to the right-hand side and read about that. And these were the checklists that we developed. And we wanted to test them. So the first step was developing the checklists and making sure that they were appropriate. And we sent them around to people all over the world and said, is this a reasonable checklist? And they were reasonable checklists. We could have done this in, in an operating room. We could have done the study in an operating room, but we would still be doing that study because we can't predict when there are going to be problems. We can't predict when we're going to have the bleeding that we would need to test and how people, how people react to the bleeding. So we had to use a simulated environment. Problems in the operating are unpredictable. Problems are low frequency. So we had to do it in the operating room. So we chose to do a simulated study. But in order to do that, we need to prove that what we were emulating really did mimic what happened in the operating room. And we developed some scenarios for six of our, uh, uh, the, the, there are seven here, but we actually used six uh, different scenarios. And we brought in teams from academic medical centers, non-academic medical centers, clinical medical centers, uh, and we brought teams in to do six cases in a day three of them with the checklist and three of them without the checklist. Yes, we did a small introduction to the checklist, so people were somewhat familiar with them, but we randomized people to using the checklist on some of the cases and others using the checklist on other cases. And 
we set up the cases. And this is how we set up the bleeding case. And on the left, and we have much better models now, is a plum on a Dixie cup with all sorts of uh, uh, rubber tubing so that we could pump blood into the surgical site. We put it into a bucket, we taped the bucket to the, the simulator, and we set it up so that there was an operative field that people came into and they were told, you need to resect this tumor. And no matter what they did during the operation, and they started out just starting to resect the tumor, we had a CAT scan showing where the tumor was, it was sitting over the femoral tri triangle, and no matter what they did, they were gonna ca cause a laceration of a major vessel, and there was gonna be bleeding. And we would control the bleeding, as well as the physiology. And we would see how they responded by looking at how many of the critical actions that were necessary to manage this consequence were done correctly, with and without the checklist. And I want to show you one of the tapes. We got permission to use this. This is actually coming in, so I'm going to have to tie this up. It is, this is, it is running. This is actually coming. Yeah, it is running. No, I'm going, to, I'm going to tie it. Connecting back. Okay. We can clamp. We need two clamps. I'm going to try to move it forward so it gets to the exciting part. Okay, I think we've got control. The vessel's coming into the tumor. So, hey, uh, I'm going to tie these off and get the clamps off. Yes. Right now, the pressure. Pressure is at 78. We're hanging back. Yes. Oh, yeah, we need some additional one to Let me start to get rid of these. It's really crashing here. Because it looks like these are coming right into Make sure you do. Thank you. Okay. Can you have help to check I just called. Here, let me, um, I'm getting off in the Let me, uh, get these out here. Deep, suck in there. That's already clamped. Oh, I do have some. Could you hear that? I, I, I hope the sound was there for you. And if you listen to it, you, if you've been in an operating room, most of you have been in an operating room, it sounds very familiar during a case where there's been a complication. No one's panicking, but there's an element of tension in the room that there's a problem going on. And that's what we try to do in simulation. We try to suspend the disbelief that you're in a simulated environment. And I've shown this video all over the world. We can't show many of them because we need to get permission from everyone to show, show them, okay? But I've shown it to people that we weren't talking about simulation and they thought it was a real operation. And that's why we were able to get the New England Journal of Medicine to accept this as a good surrogate for doing in the operating room. And this is the level of fidelity we try to reach when we do our simulations. Okay, so this was one of the, one of the teams. And what I think is even more impressive, other than the way they used the checklist, and this group did not have a checklist, was the inability for them to communicate strategically. And I will tell you, the anesthesiologist, the anesthesiologist, I'll get off that for a second so it doesn't go, go anymore. The anesthesiologist on several occasions said to the surgeon, stop doing surgery. The blood pressure was down, the heart rate was up, they were losing a significant amount of blood, and the anesthesiologist wanted to catch up. All the, all the anesthesiologists wanted the surgeon to do was to stop the bleeding, just tampon out the wound, let us catch up, and let us give you time to fix the problem. And every single time that happened, the surgeon would stop for about five to six seconds and then start doing surgery again. And that's an indication not only of where a checklist might help, but where non-technical skills and communication might help as well. And that's one of the things we're trying to mitigate through training. When we get these siloed groups that are working together to communicate in an effective way. And we don't teach that in medical school. We don't teach that in healthcare education. We're beginning to, but we didn't in the past, and we need to teach that. But we're not gonna take the best care of patients. So what we found was with the checklist, we had much better uh, compliance with the critical steps necessary to treat and mitigate the consequences of the 
set of the six different complications. And without the checklist, it was much higher. It wasn't perfect with the checklist, but it was 75% better with the checklist than without the checklist. And one of the things that I thought was even more impressive, and this shows that, you know, how people, you know, felt about the, the simulation, but even more impressively were the two things at the bottom. We asked the, the surgeons, the nurses, and the anesthesiologists, would you want the checklist in the operating room if you or a family member was having an operation? And 98% of them said yes. They wouldn't want to be in the, in the operating room without the checklist. Why? Because they had done three with and they had done three without, and they felt significantly more confident with the checklist than without the checklist. And that study was published in 2013, and many places around the world adopted our checklists. And you see our checklists all over the world. Some of them have been modified, some of them have been improved, but this was the first checklist that was that was introduced in the operating room not for the routine care but for the crisis care and i'm very proud of the work that we did on this but it wasn't adopted everywhere and it usually takes anywhere from 10 to 17 years to take what has been proven in the literature to get it to be adopted in a standard way within the healthcare industry and why didn't, why didn't people want to use it? And I've heard many, many excuses. We don't need them. We do this every day. Well, no, we don't do this every day. I'm an emergency physician. I don't resuscitate people every day. And yes, I do need a checklist every now and then because I will have some cognitive failures when I'm taking care of a very sick patient that I don't take care of very frequently. We don't, we do, we, we, what we do is too complicated to reduce it to a, to a list. Yes, we do some complicated things, but there are ways of simplifying it so that you don't forget the major things that are required to mitigate the consequences of the, of the uh, emergency. I'm too busy dealing with the emergency to read the checklist. And you're right. Who reads the checklist? The scrub nurse reads the checklist. So you need to cede some of the control from the surgeon or the anesthesiologist to somebody else. Not complete control, but just so that they listen, have we done these things? And when, when Sully Sullenberger was flying that plane into the, into the Hudson River, his co-pilot was going through the, the, the catastrophic engine failure checklist so that Sully didn't forget something. And he was the co-pilot, Sully was the pilot. And we have a long tradition of needing autonomy. And these aren't reasons to not use checklists. But that's not the only thing that we need to do. As I said, the checklists were helpful, but communication is also a problem. And we in medicine have begun to adopt what the aviation industry uses, which is called crisis resource management. They actually called it crew resource management. Some people called it cockpit resource management. And it stems from a disaster in Tenerife where two jumbo deaths hit each other. Not because there was an engine failure, not because there was uh, a problem with the, the uh, hydraulics on the, on, the, on the jets. It was a problem with communication. And they looked at it and they looked and they saw this did not need to happen. It was the biggest and greatest uh, disa aviation disaster ever. Five or 600 people died. I don't remember the exact number. But what they did is they took this experience, they, they dissected it, and they said, we need to work on a few principles. And they develop what's called crew resource management. And they go to simulation centers every six to nine months to practice these things, to make sure that they get some muscle memory and some pain muscle memory so they can manage these things. So it started, it started out because planes don't only crash because there's, there's mechanical mishaps. Communication failures cause 70, or at least our major contributors, to 71% of aviation crashes. Significant communication failure. And what's scary is that if you look at closed cases in medicine, which people do look at closed cases in medicine, about 70% of successful cases against physicians include a significant problem with communication. 
And the aviation industry invested a ton of money in developing this program. And think about it, they take pilots off the line, put them into these very expensive simulators, and they do it every six to nine months. That's very expensive. And they did it willingly. And not only did the, the, the industry do it willingly, but the pilots did it willingly. And we're still having a hard time getting attending physicians to go to the simulator. Well, why, does, why do we have problems in medicine and don't have problems in, in, the, in the aviation industry? I think there are at least two things that are contributory. One is, when we make a mistake, the patient dies. And when the pilot makes a mistake, he or she dies. So they are clearly incented to do better. And I'm not saying we're being, we're being uh, irresponsible. Well, well, maybe a little bit. But our incentives are a bit different. In the aviation industry, the people that own those planes, every time a plane goes down, it ends up in the front page of the New York Times. And the stock goes down. And it's a very expensive airplane. And ultimately, they're incented to decrease the, to decrease the consequences of poor communication. And what they, and, and I'll tell you, I'd rather be in an airplane than a car or a boat. And they are one of the safest industries, not perfect, will never be perfect, but they're one of the most safe industries. And we're still killing anywhere from 200,000 to 400,000 people a year in our hospitals. And I think we need to begin to use the principles that we've, we've used, that they've developed, and we've begun to do that, in getting more people to recognize that just, these things just don't happen. When there are problems, you need to practice and you need to, you need to use you know, things like checklists and things like, you know, there are other things to mitigate the consequences. We've got to start doing this. I want you to think back the last time you were in an emergency in the hospital or in, the, in, your, in your home or in your office. Did, it look, did that emergency, when you step back and think about it, did it look like the slide on the left or did it look like the slide on the right? And I've done this many, many times and most people say, well, it doesn't look exactly like the slide on the left, the running of the bulls in Pamplona but it also doesn't look very much like the symphony orchestra. And most people will say it looks more like the slide on the left. And that is a problem. And we will never, ever, ever be like a symphony orchestra because they have sheet music. We usually don't know what's coming next. But we need to look much more like the symphony orchestra than like the running of the bulls in Pamplona. And we need a set of principles that will help us to behave more like the slide on the right than the slide on the left. And there are differences. You have got a conductor. You've got a conductor who is leading the orchestra. You need a leader. You need somebody that can step away from the problem and oversee the entire orchestra to make sure that the oboes are coming in when the oboes need to come in and the violinists are coming in when the violinists need to come in, but not play an instrument. Because once the conductor is playing an instrument, he or she is now a musician. And we generally can't do more than one thing, especially during a low frequency, high acuity event. And how many times have you walked into a situation like this and you couldn't even tell who the leader was? Well, now we teach our residents and we're getting to teach more of our attendings when there's a problem and you can do this. And sometimes there are not enough people to do this effectively, but when you, and that's usually not the problem in, in big, large academic medical centers. If you can do it, you need to have someone that's watching the plane, that's watching the car on the road. And I could, the, the example I give is texting and driving. People that text and drive are not bad drivers in the vast majority of cases. They're just concentrating on texting and not concentrating on the tree in front of them. So you need someone that's making sure that the things that need to be done are being done. So you need a conductor. 
you need the conductor to make sure that the violinist is playing the violin and the oboist is playing the oboe. Because when the violinist is playing the oboe and the oboe is playing the violin, it just doesn't sound as good. So we need to get the right people doing the right job at the right time. And that has a lot to do with communication. People will self-differentiate into roles, but ultimately people will take on roles that they're not very good at. when there's somebody that's very good at it right in the room. And people need to communicate together so that if the conductor doesn't say something that it's appropriate because they're doing the best they can, somebody else says, are you sure that's the problem? Or are you sure that's what we should be doing? So that there should be collaboration. And the gaps in people's knowledge, and there will always be gaps in people's knowledge, will be different depending on who the person is. And what we're trying to do is use everyone's collective cognition to get to the right answer. And if you use the medical student or the student nurse or the nurse, the patient doesn't care whether it's the nurse that knows the answer or whether it's the attending physician that knows the answer. They just want the right things being done and we owe it to them. And if we can be accepting that we're gonna forget things at critical times sometimes, and I hope we don't, I hope we're perfect, but I know we're not. If we can't accept that, we're less likely to accept the suggestion. And that's an egotistical thing, not a patient-centric thing. And we need to be patient-centric. And we need to understand. And, I, and the example I give is when I was a medical student holding the retractors during an operation, what did the t attending surgeon and the, and the resident uh, assistant do? They would give me quizzes. Did I know this? Did I know that? Did I know this? Did I know that? And when I didn't know something, what did they do? They laughed. Or they made me feel small. And that is terrible. We need to accept the fact that we aren't going to know everything, but develop strategies to use the collective cognition to get to the right answer. And so that's an important feature as well. I want you to watch this. Climate tower during Eastern 401, just turned on fire. Eastern 401 heavy, continue approach to nine left. Continue approach, Roger. Actual airline pilots play the parts of the ill-fated crew. The dialogue is taken from the cockpit voice recorder and altered only to remove or change expletives and names. Certain omissions have been made to shorten the elapsed time. I'm going to try it down one more time. Eastern Flight 401 is on final approach to Miami International, runway 9 left. The nose landing gear indicator has failed to illuminate, so the crew cannot tell whether the gear is extended and locked. You want me to test the lights or not? Yeah, check it. Put the seat back. Uh, Doug, it could be light. Could you jiggle the light? It's got to come out a little and then snap in. Um, I'll put them on. Up to 2,000. You want me to fly, Doug? What frequency did he want us on? Uh, 28.6. I'll talk to him. All right, approach control Eastern 401. We're right over the airport here and climbing to 2,000 feet. In fact, we've just reached 2,000 feet, and we've got to get a green light on our nose gear. Eastern 401, roger. Turn left, heading 360. Maintain 2,000. Vectors to 9 left final. Uh, left to 360. I think it's above the red one. Yeah, I can't get it from here. I can't make it pull out either. We got pressure? Yes, sir, all systems. Put the damn thing on autopilot. All right. See if you can put that light out. Well, you got to push the switch just a little bit further forward. Now, turn it to the right a little bit. No, I don't think it's going to fit. Hey, get down there and see if that damn nose wheel's down. Okay. You got a handkerchief or something so I can get a little better grip on this? Anything I can do with it? This damn thing just won't come out, Doug. If I had a pair of pliers, I could cushion it with that cleaner. The captain has neglected to divide up flying responsibilities. Everyone is absorbed by the crisis, so they don't hear the audio alert announcing a change in altitude. Okay, I'll give you the pliers. What the hell with this? Go down and see if that red line is lined up down there. Don't screw around with that 20 cent piece of light equipment. Eastern 401, I'll go out west just a little further if we can here and see if we can get this light to come on. All right. Uh, the autopilot has somehow become disengaged. 
The plane is slowly descending, and nobody is paying any attention to the altimeter. It's always something. We could have made schedule. Well, we can tell if the damn gear is down by uh, looking down at the embassies. Sure An emergency down. landing with a possible nose gear problem is neither very risky nor all that unusual. It's an option the captain could be preparing for now. Right. It's got to be a faulty light. It's like this damn thing just won't come out. All right, just leave it there. Easton 401, how are things coming along out there? The controller's inquiry is too vague for the crew to realize he's asking about 401's surprisingly low altitude. Okay, uh, 180. did some of the altitude here. What? Uh, we're still at 2,000, right? Hey, what's happening here? That was a real flight. And 159 people died. If, if we crashed into the Everglades, that was about 25, 30 years ago. And that was just a reenactment. There was nothing wrong with that airplane. That light was just malfunctioning. The wings didn't fall off. The hydraulic system was working. That plane did not need to crash. Why did it crash? Who was in charge? No one was in charge. There wasn't anybody driving that airplane. Everyone was concentrating on that little light. And no one was concentrating on keeping that plane in the air. And there were opportunities. At one point, the co-pilot said, hey, Doug, do you want me to fly? And instead of having an answer, which would have mitigated that crash, there was no answer. Somebody interrupted. It was never answered. They went on to the next subject. You need to have closed loop communication. Not only do you have to say it, but it needs to be received. What about the air traffic controller? Everything all right up there? Now, if that air traffic controller had said, you're at 1,400 feet, you're supposed to be at 2,000 feet, what do you think would have happened? They would have said, oh, whoa, Doug, why don't you fly? But the air traffic controller didn't feel empowered to say it. I didn't say it for whatever reason. You've got to have good communication. Somebody needs to be flying. Somebody needs to be trying to fix the thing. And those are the types of situations that happen in medicine as well. And we need to develop strategies to allow people to work at the top of their license. And that's what I'm getting at. And I'm not going to teach everyone everything tonight, but I at least hope to change the way people are thinking so that ultimately we can accept our fallibility. So the five principles, and I'm not going to get into all of them. It's another whole lecture. Support, roles, communication, resources, global assessment. You need to have the right people supporting you. Call for help. And we're not good at calling for help, I'll be perfectly honest with you. That's why we have rapid response systems. Because we don't call for help. We need to make sure people are in the right roles. We need to communicate effectively. We need to make sure we have the right resources. And that the people in those roles know how to use those resources. And somebody needs to be keeping the plane in the air. We'll never be like a pit crew. They practice way too much. But we need to be more like a pit crew than the running of the bulls in Pamplona. And this is my mantra. The answer is almost always in the room. It just doesn't always get to the patient. And everyone's going to have a different gap in their knowledge. But collectively, we should be able to close most of the gaps. If I gave everyone a test on advanced cardiac life support, there'd be a spectrum of scores. Some people would do well, some people wouldn't do so well. But if I gave them one test to do collaboratively, they'd likely get a very, very high score. Because you'd use everyone's collective knowledge to get to the right answers. And the answer's almost always in the room. It just doesn't always get to the patient. I've never walked away from a not a very good scene in medicine 
saying there weren't enough smart people in the room. Now, sometimes you won't have the answer. That's just nature of things. But it is absolutely wrong to have the answer in the room and people not being able to say, to feel comfortable speaking up or feel comfortable accepting that they might not have the answer at that particular moment and have to listen to somebody else. Those are the types of things that we need to fix and that we're beginning to. And we're getting more and more research on it and we're getting more and more traction. But if we don't fix that, we could have all the all of the the, the uh, artificial intelligence and all of the checklists and all of the other things that we're gonna we're gonna bring into the situation. We're gonna not get to the right place unless we begin to communicate effectively. So what do we talk about? We talked about necessary fallibility. We talked about cognitive aids. We talked about some lag time and innovation. We talked about our own resistance to CRM and our own resistance to some of these things. And we need to, we need, and the last thing I didn't talk about, but I'll mention very, very briefly, we need to do it interprofessionally. Doctors need to train with nurses and respiratory therapists, and doctors need to, and anesthesiologists need to train with surgeons, and they need to train with emergency physicians. We need to get people speaking the same language. Because when things go bad in medicine, it's not a, it's a team sport. And we need to start working as teams. So I will stop right now and hopefully take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Posner, for taking us through a very enlightening and mind-stimulating journey of such a complex topic. We also wish you success in your endeavors of helping the mission to Mars. <laughs> I'm not going, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are going to, you know, help the mission. So in your future lectures, we would love to hear about it. So at this point, I would like to bring our um, esteemed uh, moderator, Dr. David Banyan. Thanks, uh, David, for coming out of your vacation. And we're happy that you are uh, here with us. Uh, so Dr. Banyan, can you moderate? And uh, there are some, I'm sure, you know, there are a number of questions, you know, that will be, uh, that are, um, uh, this to me speaker, you will be interested to answer it in the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, so Dr. Bamian, please take over. Sure. Allow me to begin by thanking you for uh, joining us tonight, Dr. Posner. I, I personally enjoyed your presentation tremendously. My other role uh, is um, in addition to transplant psychiatry as a consultation liaison psychiatrist. And I find that what I do a lot is uh, address actually communication problems between teams or even sometimes between patients and, and multiple teams. Uh, so uh, I'm really glad uh, that this message is getting out there. There's, there are so many uh, wonderful comments, but I will choose a select few uh, to, to, share, uh, to share with you. One, one person asked, uh, what are your ideas about how we might be able to cut the time period for the adaptation of these changes? As you, I think you mentioned about 17, 10 to 17 years uh, for introduction of findings, for example, in the medical literature to become mainstream, even things that have a momentous amount of data, which is a good example of your work, uh, developing a ever increasing uh, momentum. What are some other ways that we can do that? Ideas? You know, I wish I had an answer for you. I think it's, it's culture. People are set in their ways and they learn one way of doing things, they get comfortable doing it that way and they become resistant to change. And I wish, I, I think it needs to be part of the training that we need to become more accepting of innovation. And I think we will, I think as innovation becomes more, uh, you know, quicker and quicker, I think at some point we will become, it'll become easier. But I wish I had an answer, I don't have an answer for you. You know, but I do know that it's a problem, and a lot of it has to do with culture, and a lot of it has to do with, with uh, people's resistance to change. Change is always the most difficult thing to do, and I just find it incredible. And there are people that are working on this, but I'm not one of them. I, I wish I could give you an answer, and I'd love to hear if anybody else has any thoughts. That, that segues into another, another question uh, from another uh, of our uh, participants tonight. It, are the findings, are your group's findings being incorporated at the level of the medical school so that medical students are going to start to have experiences 
that I guess would be, I would say maybe somewhat analogous to the interprofessional team, which has now become a standard. And it, it has become a standard. And, and, and I, I can't think of a medical school in the country that doesn't use simulation, at least for skills training. And we're seeing more and more medical schools doing interprofessional education, bringing in nursing students, bringing in other, other disciplines, uh, you know, to begin to decipher the, the communication you know, skills. One of the, I'll give you an, an example. We do a lot of interprofessional education at Stratus. We, we, I just got a grant. We are, we have introduced interprofessional education or inter, a simulation based interprofessional training program for all new hires at Brigham that are going to touch a patient, be they assistants, medical assistants, be they attending surgeons, be they physical therapists, anybody that could touch a patient that needs to potentially be involved in a problem with a patient has to be part of this. We just had our third class today. We're probably gonna train about 1,000 to 1,500 people over the next year, and we're gonna see whether we made any difference. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to prove we made a difference, but at least we started it. That's the type of thing that we need to do. And we're seeing more and more of that. We're doing much more interprofessional education in our simulation center. We're bringing nurses and residents and attendings into the center in order to uh, learn how to communicate together. One of the things that I find incredibly rewarding is when a nurse has worked with a physician for 10 years and said, during the debriefing says, that's why you do that? <laughs> You know, they've been working together forever and they have two different mental models of what's going on. Well, we're never gonna change that mental model unless we start training together. And I know the consequences are hard because it costs money to do that. You gotta take people out of where they're making money and there's not a great incentive in medicine to do that. Actually, that, I was going to, you, you uh... To use uh, one of my terms, uh, I guess I must have thought broadcasted directly to you. You were just about to answer a question that I had, and that was that uh, in the academic setting, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure, especially for uh, attending physicians, as you just pointed out, uh, right? Either whether you're in clinic or you're in the operating room or uh, rounding on the wards or whatever it is. Um, how did you go about uh, being persuasive um, with your cause and getting, uh, and getting buy-in from the, from the stakeholders? Okay, so that's a, that's a phenomenal question. I've not been terribly successful. Uh, it, it really starts with, the, with, with money, okay? okay? And we, we now have an OR training program that we bring in nurses, scrub techs, uh, surgeons and anesthesiologists. And the way that was started was by our insurance company. Crico is the Harvard, Harvard affiliated insurance company. We're self-insured. And we're very lucky that we have a group of folks that are interested in putting the insurance business out of business. Uh -huh. Okay, so what they did is they said, we're gonna, we're gonna support this program for three years. And it was so successful. And why they needed to support it, we needed to get the surgeons out of the OR. We needed to get mostly the nurses out of the OR, okay, so that they could be, they could be backfilled, okay? And it was so successful. People saw the value in it that even without the support of the grant, they're still doing it. We need to talk to the CFOs. I can talk until I'm red in the face to the risk managers. They're, they're converted, but they don't control the money. Right. What, one of the things that I'm doing within the simulation world is in my, in my position in the simulation world is trying to convince the CFOs that this is important stuff and that there, there's a return on investment to doing this. And we need more data supporting that if you do things in simulation, there are other ways of doing it. I'm not saying that's the panacea. But if you do things in simulate with simulation, it mitigates the cost of doing poorly in the clinical field. And we do have some, do, we do have some, uh, some examples of it. Central line infections. We now know that if you go through a central line course 
in a simulated environment and show that you have the competence of doing it, you will decrease the infections. Why is that one of the few places where you have data? Because Medicare decided they weren't going to pay for central line infections anymore. So the hospitals were incented to decrease the central line infection rate. And they realized that there was some data supporting simulation in that realm. So it, again, I hate to be a cynic, uh, but it's about money, like everything else in medicine, unfortunately. The incentive has to be correct. It has to be set up correctly, right? I think that's, that's, what you said, that's part of the challenge. Uh, a couple of other questions here, too, that segue nicely with one another. One is um, a person was asking your thoughts about the incorporation of decision-making tools or decision-making algorithms into the electronic medical record, which I believe is already in process. I know that we have that at my institution for certain things. Uh, not in psychiatry, I believe. Maybe that's coming down the line, uh, but I have seen some. And another person was asking about, I guess, um, something similar about having a checklist for major, you know, inflection points in, in a patient's clinical care. And we need to we need to understand where those inflection points are. And I agree, we can we can we can do that. And we're looking. One of the ways we're looking at it. I want to talk about the first thing. And remember, because I have a terrible memory, I want to talk, answer your first question after this. One of the things we're looking at is can we identify where the clinician is in trouble? And we're using biometrics to do that. We're doing studies where we have people with five lead EEGs, heart rate variability, galvanometry, and various eye tracking and blink rates to see whether we can identify where a surgeon is at the most vulnerable point. So we're gonna we're gonna we're attacking it from both ends, not only from the from the end in the end uh, from the end of the procedure, what part of the procedure. You know, the specific procedure will have, you know, we'll, we'll have a checklist or we'll have some uh, cognitive aid for that. But where, do we, how do we identify it through the surgeon? Not through our imagination of where the problem is. Can we identify where the problem is? And that's some of the work we're doing with NASA right now. Very interesting. Very, very the interesting. Other, the other question was what, remind me. Oh, I think the other one was um, using checklists uh, at particular when, for example, when the patient clinician or the team actually they think of it as a team and the patient are the care team and the patient are facing a major decision. It wasn't specified what kind. Yeah, is, no, that was the inflection point we were talking about. There was a, there was a question right before uh, the that. The first one was uh, incorporation of of essentially oh, decision making tools in the medical record. Right. I think that is brilliant but it's turning into white noise, mm -hmm. okay? We've got to be really thoughtful how we do this. If it increases my cognitive load, it's not going to be helpful. If it, if it increases my, you know, the, the inefficiency of the work I do, it won't be effective. I think artificial intelligence and virtual reality and mixed reality and various things with cognitive aids that you might be wearable at some point will be very, very helpful. But they need to be done in a way that will promote their use and not stand in the way of their use. And I think right now we, we use Epic. Epic is, can, I think when Epic is finally sort of integrated well into the system, I think it has tremendous opportunity to, to improve care. My apologies. But it's such a pain in the neck. Yeah, my apology. You know, I think uh, we are. Uh, this is a phenomenal discussion. You know, um, but I'm again, sorry. I, I as you know, because this is a difficult role for me as the timekeeper. Every time I do this, I Murray, you know, I can talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like this job. Uh, anyway, um, you know, I think we have got time for one more question, and uh, yeah, please. Sure. Dr. Banyan, uh, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to pick uh, the lucky person here to get the last question. The other question was, if, this, if you think that the safety culture would be dramatically improved if, in fact, the malpractice and litigation system were to shift, and instead of being individual, uh, to use the person's words, individual blame-based versus more system-focused, and would that, would that kind of paradigm shift also then incentivize, uh, I'm adding this now in addition to the person's question, uh, would that kind of paradigm shift then also incentivize uh, greater investment 
into something that is clearly badly needed? Well, I, 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 I think that anything we can do to improve our, uh, our, our malpractice system would be beneficial, as long as it's the right, the right improvement. I will say, and the, the answer I'll give you goes back to Crico. Okay, here's an insurance company, and Kaiser's another one that's self-insured and wants to put itself out of business. Okay, the insurance companies, most insurance companies don't want to eliminate malpractice because they go out of business. Okay, these insurance companies that, that want to go out of business are investing in things like this. You know, my, my, we've had multiple grants from Prico that have supported the work that we're doing. You know, and, and you know, malpractice is, you know, there's malpractice out there. And, you know, that needs to be dealt with. And I'm not, I'm not saying we're going to ever get rid of, you know, all of malpractice. I mean, there, there are consequences to some of the things that we do. But if the insurance companies would, would, would invest in decreasing the number of closed claims or the number of claims by things like artificial intelligence, by things like checklists, by things like simulation and getting people to go to centers and, and, and improving the, the, the undergraduate and graduate medical education, we will see an improvement. And we're already seeing an improvement. I wish I had data. I wish Crico would share the data about the work that we're doing. They don't. But I know their actuaries aren't doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're seeing that these interventions are working. Mm -hmm. And we need to get more people to see that they're working. And we need, as a, as a, as a simulation community and as a risk management community, we need to do the studies that get to the CFOs and the CEOs to say, this is worth investing in. Because ultimately, they're looking for ways to mitigate the cost of doing business. Right. And if we can decrease the cost of doing business through preventative management, we'll start seeing a change in how, how, how uh, the, medical, the medical community approaches this. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's the beginning of the journey. It is a journey. Yeah, a, very, a very important one. And one that has to be united. We need to be united in it. And physicians have an important leadership role, but we can't function within a silo. Absolutely, we gotta get rid of the silos. We gotta get rid of the hierarchies. I've never seen a hierarchy that hasn't killed a patient. <laughs> Very, very well said. Thank you, Dr. Posner, again, and thank you, Dr. Benyan. At this point, you know, I request to Dr. David, thank you. to honor our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vijay. Uh, can you put a slide on, please? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, our moderator first, Dr. David Banyan. Thank you very much, sir, for coming to join us today in spite of your on vacation. And indeed, it's a great discussion, even though you're starting late. And uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Posner, for joining us today for eloquent and very simulation uh, pro, uh, uh, speaking today. I would like to recognize Dr. Charles Neil Posner, MD, for his outstanding contribution in simulation medicine and welcome him as a member of AIPI Distinguished Speaker Club. So, Dr. John Lagarda, President of the Vemuri Asmurti, Chairman AAP Webinar CMA Company, and September uh, 9th, 2020. Thank you again, and indeed, and uh, looking forward more and more. And uh, good night. Thank you. This good night. Was, Thank you very good. much. It was fun. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Bye, Vermeer. Thanks, Jack.